So, to get cracking this evening then, we'll just kick off with a summary of last week, of week 7. Um, and then we'll be looking at a section uh, that's entitled Our Bible. Uh, and that will deal with really how the Bible came to us, through the from the Hebrew and Greek original manuscripts through to the, the Bibles that we can read today. Then I'll hand over to, to Jared for a section on the Gospels. And then we'll continue our little series on study tools with part two, and we'll summarise after that. So, in summary of week seven then, we considered three topics. Um, the first being the mystery, um, which uh, we, we read in Colossians, it's a verse we looked at last week. The mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to God's saints. And so what we learnt last week was that previously, uh, in the, the New Testament times, up until Jesus was upon the earth, I think some things were a mystery to the world up until that day. Um, but after that, God has revealed his plan to us. Um, and that revelation is complete, and so there is no more mystery. We then looked at the period between the Testaments, um, looking at what the Jews did, how they were uh, treated in that time, the, the way they were ruled over. Um, we looked at how prophecy influenced that time, that the Jews were looking for their Christ, for their Messiah to come, and to save them from the rule of the Romans. And then we had a section on Bible terminology. We looked at two words in particular, um, the first being Antichrist, um, and we looked at uh, verses in uh, John's epistles particularly, uh, showing that anyone can be an antichrist if they deny that Jesus is the Christ. And we also looked at the word church and how the words um, and the way it was used in the New Testament um, is the word ecclesia, which uh, applies to the congregation, the group of people, and not the building itself. So, that's a brief summary of last week. So... This week, then, our first topic is our Bible. Um, it would probably be helpful to have your workbooks open at this point. Um, on page 65, um, there is this section on our Bible, and it deals with um, how the Bible came to us in its English printed form um, from the original Hebrew and Greek uh, manuscripts. So, We'll take a tour through history um, fairly quickly there. The Old Testament was written on scrolls um, in Hebrew. Uh, scrolls that would look something like that. It could be rolled out um, with, with uh, pages sort of sewn together. Uh, they were written um, between 2000 and up to 400 BC. Um, uh, across that period of time, the whole of the, the Old Testament was written um, in Hebrew. And we can be sure that the, the manuscripts that, uh, sorry, that the Bibles that we have now are based on the manuscripts that were, that were written then. Um, because of this discovery that was made in 1947 of what's called the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were um, surprisingly a set of scrolls found at the Dead Sea, uh, very imaginatively named. Um, so they date from around 100 BC, so quite soon after the New Test the Old Testament was finished um, being written. Um, so this, this is a relatively new copy after it was finished being written. And what was discovered was that these scrolls um, very much reflect um, very accurately the scrolls that our Bibles were translated from. Um, so that discovery really... Uh, confirms to us that, that the Bibles we have are accurate representations of what was originally written. Um, so looking down your workbooks then, uh, we're on page 65 in the workbooks, um, looking at the section on our Bibles, so how the Bible came to us from its original forms. So the Greek then, the Old Testament, the New Testament was written in Greek, but the Old Testament was also translated into Greek, um, what's called a Septuagint. Uh, it's the Greek version of the Old Testament. Um, and then there was this Bible 
the Codex Alexandrinus, um, there's also the Codex Sinaiticus, which were complete um, versions of the Bible in Greek. So the Septuagint and the Greek New Testament sort of combined into one Bible. So these are relatively original scripts um, that, that uh, came about soon after the original manuscripts were written. But then when Greek was no longer the dominant language in the world, um, Latin became the, uh, the preeminent language, uh, this was translated into Latin um, from the Greek and the Hebrew um, uh, to create this Latin Vulgate Bible in around 400 AD. Um, and there was also at this time the, the Lindisfarne Gospels, which uh, were, were the Gospels written in, um, in Latin, but with particular pictures and that woven into them, I believe, um, very artistic sort of work. And that was then translated into English in the 10th century. This is one of the first times that um, any part of the Bible started to be translated into English. And this was followed by this man called John Wycliffe, um, who in the 1300s um, translated uh, the Bible, particularly the, the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, into English. Um, and this was the first Bible that was produced in English in its uh, entirety. Um, and that was from the Latin Vulgate. So it wasn't directly translated from the original scripts, but it was from, from the Latin translation. And then soon after that, in the 1450s, the printing press was invented, which uh, revolutionised how Bibles could be produced, because they, previously they had to all be handwritten out and hand-translated and copied very painstakingly, uh, letter by letter. Uh, but now they could be sort of mass-produced in the printing press. Um, and so this man, William Tyndale, was heavily involved in... Um, translating the Bible into English, and he was the first to produce um, the New Testament printed in English, uh, as opposed to, to handwritten. And he translated much of the Bible, um, Old Testament and New Testament, from the original Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, and he was the first to, to do so. Previously it would be based on the Vulgate. But he never produced an entire Bible, um, Miles Coverdale in uh, 1535 was the first to produce a complete printed version of the Bible in English, which was a huge breakthrough at the time, and uh, we have much to thank Miles Coverdale for, uh, for, for that work, and also all the others, of course, like Clifton and Tyndale. Um, and so Coverdale then produced in 1535 uh, the the first complete printed Bible. Um, and so there's a chart here now which sort of summarises some of that. Don't try and follow all the arrows, I tried that and it just makes your head hurt. Um, but that sort of summarises who used what to get to their version of the Bible. And what we see is they all lead down to this uh, final point really uh, in 1611 when the King of England at the time, King James, um, commissioned um, a group of people to produce a uh, sort of common, common translation of the Bible, known as the King James Version, or the Authorised Version. And that's still probably the most common and most well-known version of the Bible uh, that, that is around, um, and considered to be probably the most accurate translation of the original Hebrew and Greek texts, and that's probably the Bible we've all got with us today, a uh, King James Version, or an Authorised Version Bible. Uh, so that's a brief summary then of how the English Bible in its entirety came about. So it's from the Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, written um, from 2000 through BC through to about 100 AD, um, which were then translated into Latin, which Wycliffe and Tyndale then translated from the Latin and from the Hebrew and Greek into English, and then 1611, the King James Version was written. But beyond that, other translations, of course, have been made, and um, the King James Version has been revised, there is a new King James Version, and there are a, a series of, there's a, a large number of um, 
translations of the Bible which are available today. Um, there's a list of a few of them there, there's many of us. Um, some of these are accurate, some are less so. Um, they've been uh, translated in different ways. Some have been translated from the original texts and from the Codex Alexandrinus and so on. Some are um, almost paraphrases of other English translations which are then of course less reliable. There's more human influence in, in what's written there. Um, so what we would suggest is that when trying to choose a, um, a version of the Bible, um, talk to someone who's uh, got some more experience, talk to one of us um, presenters for this series, or, or anyone else who's got experience with translations of the Bible. Um, some are good for reference, but not for reading in their entirety. So um, translations like the uh, English Standard Version, maybe, I find very useful myself, or I don't fully understand a passage. It'll be translated slightly differently, maybe, in one of the other translations, and you get a better understanding, but, um, but may not be so good for reading in its entirety. Uh, so that's a, a brief overview, then, of the history of the English Bible, um, some of the modern translations that are available there, the Revised Standard Version, the New International Version, and so on. There are many of them available. Um, and so, yes, we would suggest asking someone for advice when trying to choose a, a version of the Bible to read and to study for yourself. Um, okay, so next section tonight, then we're going to look at uh, the Gospels. And uh, if you look at the structure of the Bible, you'll find that they're the first four books in the New Testament. We have the Gospel records as recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. And uh, essentially what they do is they uh, reveal to us, in the way that they recorded, different aspects of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they're split into two groups, really. There's the first three, written by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are called the Synoptic Gospels, which cover uh, the same events but from the perspective of these three particular writers who were eyewitnesses of Jesus at the time, uh, all of course under the uh, influence and uh, control of the Holy Spirit. And then after that, slightly differently, we have John's Gospel. Um, so we have these, these four Gospel records, each one of them uh, focusing on and revealing to us in a bit more uh, detail specific aspects of Jesus' character and life during his ministry years. What we're going to do, though, is just go back into the Old Testament, because if you go back into uh, the Old Testament, into Ezekiel, so if you just go into the Old Testament and uh, just pass the Psalms, uh, you get to the, all the prophets, um, Ezekiel, Daniel, so forth. So if you go to Ezekiel, um, in the Bibles we're using on page 756, we have here uh, some words of the prophet Ezekiel. And just to put it in context, uh, this is much earlier. This is 600 years before Christ, 600 B.C., this is God's message to the uh, prophet Ezekiel, giving them, uh, giving him a message to give to the faithful ones uh, who were exiled at this time. So the whole nation of Israel had been taken away into captivity in Babylon. But uh, God has given this vision to Ezekiel uh, of a future glori glorious, uh, glorified and restored Israel. And this was there to uh, inspire and to infuse and to strengthen the faith of those who still believed, even though they were in exile at this time. So, let's look at um, Ezekiel chapter 1 and look at verses 5 and 6. Also, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. Go down to verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side and they four had the face of an ox on the left side they four also had the face of an eagle so there's Ezekiel he has this vision given to him by God this wonderful picture uh, in symbolic language detailing uh, things to do with Israel in the future being fully restored and we have in that tenth verse there these four faces a man a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Okay? So, if we go to verse 28, 
of uh, chapter 1 of Ezekiel. Verse 28 says, As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. And chapter 2 goes on to say, well, that voice speaks. So we have this glorious, bright image. Uh, we have the bow in the cloud in the day of rain. So that's a thing of a rainbow, that uh, symbol that God gave after he judged the world via the flood to Noah and his, uh, his sons and their wives. Uh, that he, uh, the promise that he wouldn't flood the earth again, but it's uh, the bow in the sky is, is all the colours together uh, in one uh, symbol, and so there's a, a unifying sort of coming together of all these colours in the in the rainbow, and so in this vision that uh, Ezekiel had, we have these four faces all illustrating and indicating for us four aspects of something glorious in the future to come. So this was uh, the uh, the world of the Lord Jesus at uh, the time of uh, his ministry years. Um, this was the Roman Empire um, at its uh, time around uh, 2,000 years ago. And you can see the old names there for the, the countries of uh, Southern Europe. But anyway, the, uh, this image, these um, pictures, these images in this vision that uh, Ezekiel was recording were talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's this fourfold view of the Lord Jesus Christ and each of the Gospels relates to uh, one of these images, one of these uh, creatures in chapter 1 of Ezekiel. So you have uh, the lion uh, which, which relates to the work um, that Matthew did when he recorded his Gospel. So when you think about a lion, what does a lion symbolize? So we have the symbol of the lion, this picture of the lion for us in Ezekiel and if you think about what a lion is and what it represents well, the lion is, of course, uh, referred to as the king of beasts or the king of the jungle. Uh, and you often find the lion used in heraldry for uh, nations. So it's on coinage or flags, things like that. And it's a symbol of strength and of power. And this idea of kingship is represented by uh, the lion. And in Matthew's Gospel, there's great emphasis on the kingly qualities of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the second symbol is that of the ox. Well, what's an ox when you think about it? It's a large, uh, powerful beast used for strength. In ancient times, it was used to pull a cart uh, and could do so all day long, no trouble, carry heavy loads. And so Mark's Gospel emphasizes the work of the ox, which is service, which is a, a servant. So you have emphasis in that Gospel of the servant work that Jesus did. He was a servant to... Uh, the disciples, you know, he washed their feet, he, he made himself like a servant to them, uh, something that no, most people wouldn't dare to do, because if you were a servant, you were the lowest of the low in society. But uh, Jesus was quite prepared to wash the feet of his um, disciples, so that's an em a point which emphasizes his work as a servant. The third symbol uh, is the symbol uh, of the f a man, and uh, in Luke's Gospel, which emphasizes this characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have uh, the reference to this symbol of the man, and he's often described as the son of man. So he was a human, uh, like we are. Uh, he lived a life, that, so he therefore understands the life that we have, the temptations, the difficulties that we have. So he understands what it's like to be like us, because he was born of a human mother, even though his father was God himself. So this aspect is emphasized in Luke's Gospel. And then finally, uh, John's Gospel, uh, is connected to the uh, sign of the eagle and if you think about what an eagle is again you find an eagle uh, in certain um, uh, heraldry and it's, it's symbolic with certain nations but what is an eagle? It's something which flies up high towards the heavens and it's known for its sight uh, remarkable sight that can uh, spot something moving on the ground from a great uh, from a great distance away so in John's Gospel we have uh, the lofty sort of son of God uh, godly higher sort of uh, characteristics of the Lord Jesus Christ and his spiritual sight. Uh, his words which were accurate in their assessment and judgment spiritually of things that he saw and spoke about. So these four symbols uh, really give us this fourfold view of the Lord Jesus Christ in his character and in the work that he did as recorded through these um, four Gospels. 
Now, uh, obviously, the image that we have recorded for Ezekiel is speaking of a future time for a restored and glorified Israel, which other prophecies indicate for us uh, will also include the Lord Jesus Christ returning back to the earth again, sitting on the throne of his forefather David, uh, and the perfection of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be expanded throughout the whole world because the, the kingdom of God is going to be uh, 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 not only a restoration of Israel but uh, a perfection and a, 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 a reversal of the way the world is from what it is today to what it was in the beginning. So in the beginning it was made perfect and God is going to restore it to perfection. Uh, he's going to remove all the sin from the world and all the wickedness that men do and restore the whole world to this perfect state. And uh, for a bit more detail about the four Gospels, if you go to page 73 in your workbooks, there's a good breakdown of each of those four Gospels. Uh, there are uh, information there about uh, the time it was written, a quick summary of what goes on in each of the Gospels, the emphasis uh, of each Gospel as related to these four faces, these four symbols that we have in Ezekiel chapter 1, and also some uh, verses and references which point to things that are uh, underlying and, and related to some of the themes that you have in the scriptures and some of the key events in each of those Gospels. So that's there for you on page 73. So briefly then, that's uh, a quick run through uh, what the Gospels emphasize and why we have the four of them. And as we said, that's the, uh, the map of the world as it was in the time when these were penned and when Christ was alive. And I'll now hand back over to Ben. Thank you, Jared. Um, so, we're now going to have a look uh, at continuing the little series we're doing on study tools, things that you can use to help you understand the Bible as you read it. Um, so, there's a list of a few things on the screen there. Um, we've looked at some of these already. So, Mark, I think, did a section on uh, using your margin uh, and cross references. Uh, a few weeks ago. Um, we've had a look at concordances and lexicons and computer Bibles and how to use those to understand the Greek and Hebrew words that uh, the original um, manuscripts use. Um, this evening we're going to have a bit more of a think about uh, maps and atlases and handbooks um, and how these can be used uh, alongside uh, reading the Bible, and that, that's an important thing to re-emphasize, that none of these things take the place of reading the Bible, they're just to help you understand the Bible as, as you read it. Um, so maps then um, can be very handy to know where events were taking place uh, in the world. Uh, Jared's just shown the map of um, the Roman Empire at the time of uh, the Gospels. Uh, there's a map here of um, the land of Palestine or Israel in, in the times of the New Testament. And there's some places here, that are Jerusalem um, and Nazareth, where, where Jesus was, um, grew up, and Bethlehem, where he was born. Um, and so it can be useful to get an understanding of where things are taking place, so you can understand the context of what's being said. And sometimes that opens up a bit more meaning and a bit more understanding of the events that go on. Um, there's a map here of Jerusalem as it was in the New Testament. And if you just come with me to John chapter 9, we'll just demonstrate a quick example of, of how this type of map um, or atlas can be used um, to, to get a bit more understanding of what's going on in the passage. So in John 9, um, Actually, the end of John 8 first, so verse 59 of John 8. Um, they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So Jesus is coming out of the temple at this point, um, which we can see on the map here. Um, the temple is here. Um, and then going then into the chapter 9 and verse 1, as Jesus passed by, so as he was coming out of the temple, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Um, and we're not going to go into the story here of what actually happens, but um, Jesus heals this man of his blindness, 
And the way he does this, um, in verse 7, part of the way that this man was healed, he says, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. It's very easy to just read over that and see, okay, this man went to the pool of Siloam and washed. But when you look at the map of what this man had to do, he was over at the temple here, and the pool of Siloam is shown here. So he had to get from here down the temple steps. Um, he would have had to come down the temple steps to the pool of Siloam, which was, remember, this man was blind. Now these temple steps were huge um, blocks of stone, really, which um, could be hazardous for, for a blind man. He could fall off the side, or, or um, you yeah, could get, get in trouble for falling down these steps. Um, Quite seriously, these were very large steps. So he had to come down these steps to the pool of Siloam just to wash because a man had told him to, that he might receive his sight. So this, just by looking at a map and understanding what this blind man had to do, we get more of an insight into the faith he must have had in Jesus Christ that he was able to heal this man's sight because he went on a hazardous journey for a blind man. Um, to follow the commands of Jesus. And so that's just uh, one very quick example of, of using uh, a map or an atlas to, to get a bit of an understanding of the context of um, the, the passage. Um, this is a, a, a good atlas to use. This has a series of uh, maps and places that are used throughout the Bible. Um, as does this one from Martin Gilbert. Uh, this doesn't just deal with the atlas of the Bible, but of Jewish history. As it says there, from 2000 BC to the present day. So you can trace the Jews uh, through history and see how prophecies were fulfilled in, in the places which they ended up in. Um, you can also use uh, Bible handbooks. So. People over um, the decades and centuries have written uh, books um, about the Bible, about particular passages or books or characters or, or themes. And we can use these as references um, to, to gain a better understanding of what these passages are about. Because these people have, have done the study um, themselves and have recorded that. And so we can use their work to, to get a better understanding of, of the passages. Again, to re-emphasise, not instead of reading the Bible, these books from others, um, such as this Harmony of Samuel, Kings and Chronicles, these aren't inspired. These are written by man. Um, but they can be useful as reference points to try and enhance our understanding of what we're reading. Um, this is uh, Vine's... Uh, dictionary of biblical words. I think John Thompson might have mentioned this one a few weeks ago uh, when he was doing his section on concordances. Uh, this is beneficial when looking at the Hebrew and Greek words and what they mean um, to get a better understanding that way. Um, and like I said, there are, there are handbooks to the Bible. This one, um, and there are ones like this, that don't necessarily deal with things in the Bible itself, but deal with um, artefacts maybe that were from the time, with um, you know, information about what the world was like in particular Bible times. There's pictures there of um, times from looks Egyptian. Um, I'm not going to guess what the others are, but there's, there's pictures of uh, and examples of artefacts from particular times, which can again help to get an understanding of the context in which Bible events occur. And this is a particularly good book, I have to say. Um, I meant to bring it with me tonight, actually, but I forgot. Um, the 66 Books of the Bible, which, um, again, is a handbook to go with the Bible, but gives a summary of each book, so that um, before maybe you start reading a book um, or studying it, you can look at this to just get an overview of what it's about and uh, who it was written by and when it was written and, and such like. Um, and there are other books like that, more detailed ones on particular Bible passages, but that's a very good one for, for an overview um, of the Bible.
level as a whole. Uh, and so, coming back to this list then, um, Bible margin can call into lexicon, those have been dealt with um, in previous weeks. Um, we spoke earlier uh, about other versions of other translations of the Bible, which can be handy to, to um, look at maybe a difficult passage that you can't understand, look at how else it's been translated in some of the other versions, which may help you to, to uh, understand the meaning of the original language. And so a reminder then, I think we've seen this slide before as well, or, or one like it, um, tips for, for approaching reading the Bible. Um, so firstly, uh, you've got to be ready in a good uh, state of mind, prepared to read the Bible. You've got to allow a good amount of time. Um, five minutes isn't enough to get a proper understanding. If five minutes is all you've got, then fine. Um, but you really need longer periods of time to really get your head around particular passages. Uh, select a good translation. Um, like I said, there are some translations out there which aren't so good, um, which are paraphrases uh, of the original language. Um, so select a good translation and ask, ask for advice on, on selecting those translations. And then once you're reading, um, we've spoken previously about Bible echoes. Think about other things you've read in the Bible, whether um, there are links between passages, echoes of, of something else you've read. Uh, use these study tools that we're talking about, um, the maps, the atlases, the concordances, the handbooks. Um, some of them, the handbooks, may point out some Bible echoes, which you may not have noticed. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not about... Uh, it's not about what you can discover um, for yourself necessarily, it's not about man's pride, it's about learning. Um, however, that learning can be done, so to seek help. If you're struggling with something, there's no shame in asking for help. Um, everyone else needs some help as well. Um, if possible, read aloud. Um, it helps to uh, get into the flow, um, get into the mind of the events, the people that were that were happening, that were there, um, and be patient because um, the, the answers don't necessarily come immediately. Um, I've spoken to people studying the Bible for 60 years and they, they still come across new things, answers to questions they've had for decades. Um, and so yes, be patient, don't expect answers, uh, like I said, within five minutes, it, it takes time. Um, and look for other translations if, if they may help to uh, understand uh, passages that you're struggling with. Um, so yeah, that's the second part of our mini-series on study tools, and so I'll hand back to Jared to summarise. Thanks, Ben. Okay, so what have we looked at tonight in uh, week eight? We've looked at uh, our Bible, in particular the New Testament. We've looked a little bit at the, uh, the Gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And uh, we quickly looked at uh, the history of the Bible up to Christ and the four Gospels, how they represent four aspects of Christ's character, uh, symbolized by the, uh, the man, the lion, the eagle and the ox, all emphasizing uh, symbolically, as we saw in Ezekiel, emphasizing these re Gospel records, four aspects of his character. We've also had a quick look at uh, study tools again, part two, and uh, so any questions, by all means, uh, we're uh, uh, welcome to, uh, like to discuss any questions that you have and hopefully help you in your understanding and demysteriorize some of the things that you've been reading about possibly.